Hello, welcome to today's webinar. I am Abby Walsh, the Director of the Council on Criminal Justice, and I'll be facilitating today's session. We're so pleased that you can join us for the release of our latest report here at the Council on Criminal Justice, Trends in Correctional Control by Race and Sex. Now, discussions of racial disparities in the criminal justice system have rightly been front and center for some time, but they have taken on renewed energy in our current moment of reform, presidential debates, and national attention. The Council's latest report sheds new light on this topic, showing that progress can be made, that much work is left to do, and perhaps pointing us in the direction of more effective policy. We'll be hearing from three speakers today. Adam Gelb, the President and CEO of the Council on Criminal Justice. We'll also be hearing from the researchers who worked on this report. William Sable is now a professor of criminal justice and criminology at the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at Georgia State University and a former director of the Bureau of Justice Statistics. And Thaddeus Johnson is a PhD candidate at, in criminology and criminal justice at the Andrew Young School of Public Policy and also a graduate teaching assistant. Our speakers are going to be available to take your questions at the close of today's session. You can submit your questions at any time during our presentation by clicking the chat icon at the top of your screen. You'll be able to type your question there. It will come to me and I will be sure that it's relayed to our speakers at the end of our presentation. With that, I'm happy to hand it over to Adam Gelb, our president and CEO, to introduce the report. Thank you so much, Abby, um, for the introduction and for getting us to, to this point today where we can actually get this monster out the door. Um, as many of you know, the Council is a brand new organization. We just uh, officially formed in, at the end of March of this year and publicly launched in July. So this is really one of our first uh, major, major events or one of our first major research pieces. Um, our mission at the Council is to advance understanding of the criminal justice policy choices facing the nation and to build consensus for solutions that enhance safety and justice for all. And, of course, a key part of achieving that goal is to ground criminal justice debates in facts, evidence, and fundamental principles of justice. That's kind of our holy trinity here. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing with this report. Um, as Abby said, racial disparities are among the most important issues in the criminal justice field and now in the political arena as well, particularly in the presidential campaign. And so uh, we, we thought as one of our first efforts, it's absolutely just critical to have a deeper understanding of what's happening and why. So with this report, we unpack the numbers uh, at the macro level across the four main criminal justice populations uh, by sex, by offense type, and critically, by stages of criminal justice processing in order to get a better sense of the decisions that are being made by the police, by the courts, corrections, and parole. Uh, when we started, uh, we certainly knew that some of the gaps were narrowing, but honestly, it didn't have a sense of by how much. And I was really surprised by what we found. Uh, much of what's happening is good news. In some cases, it's very good news with disparity ratios cut in half or even two thirds in some cases. But let's be clear, while many of the gaps are shrinking, they are still large. This is a situation that's gone from worse to bad. There's no mission accomplished banner hanging on the battleship here. There's much, much more to be done. We have two main aspirations for the report in that, in that spirit. Uh, the first is we hope that policymakers and researchers use it as a springboard to better diagnose and tackle what's working and what's not in their jurisdictions. You know, this type of analysis should be replicated many times over at the state and local levels. Second, we hope that it's a source of inspiration for advocates and reformers and anyone concerned uh, about disparities in the system, uh, a source of inspiration that says progress is possible, that efforts to change the system and public attitudes can have impact. Now, many of you know that uh, Sally Yates co-chairs our Board of Trustees along with Mark Holden of Koch Industries. And when we launched uh, the council this summer, she said of the, uh, of the criminal justice system in general, uh, quote, it's not enough to admire the problem, we need meaningful reform, end quote. And that's how we see this report is helping build a more precise roadmap of what needs to be done in order to move us to a fairer and more equitable society. With that, I'll turn it over to our principal author, uh, Bill Sable, to walk through the findings. Uh, as Abby said, he's a former director of the Federal Bureau of Justice uh, Statistics, uh, and as, as that, and is a 
other uh, prior work, Bill knows this data like the back of his hand, uh, perhaps better than anyone in the nation. Um, he's now teaching Georgia State University in Atlanta. I'm delighted he was able to lead this project um, along with his, his colleagues there. Um, so Bill, over to you. Um, thanks, Adam. Abby, could you go to the research question slide and we'll just start with that? So um, as Adam said, uh, the main purpose of this point is to describe national level trends and disparities in correctional populations. We initially started looking just at prison populations and the idea was, well, what about prison, what about jails, probation, parole? So we looked at those. Um, so that, the first question, what are the trends of disparity? And uh, we're looking at black-white disparity and Hispanic-white disparities. Then second, the bulk report focused on prison uh, system, state prisons to be uh, more precise. So we wanted to know whether there were crime type specific changes in disparity in imprisonment rates, whether or not we observed these by sex by type of crime. And then the final question gets at the point that Adam brought up about um, how changes in uh, criminal justice case processing could affect uh, whether they, how they affected black, white imprisonment rates and to help lead to some of the understanding of factors that are behind uh, the imprisonment rate trends. So we'll go through those. So next slide, please, Abby. So high level findings um, uh, are well, one, racial ethnic disparities decline across the prison, jail, probation, and full populations. Secondly, uh, the black, white imprisonment disparities fell across the measured crime categories, uh, violent, property, drug, public order, and the residual category. Thirdly, um, the decrease in the black-white disparity imprisonment for women was larger than for men. Um, fourth, we did observe Hispanic-white disparities in all four correctional populations narrowing. And then fifth, kind of looking at case processing stuff, um, uh, for three categories of violent crime, rape, rape and sexual assault, robbery and aggravated assault, we found fairly large decreases in black rates of offending that contributed to declines in black imprisonment rates that were partially offset by increases in time served or expected time served. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. And then uh, for drugs, a uh, big fall in the drug arrest rate for blacks and the imprisonment uh, admission rate for blacks accounted for a lot of the decrease in the imprisonment rate. I'm going to go through some figures from the report that illustrate these findings and repeat them, but the figures, I think, are a little more illuminating than the text. So next slide, please, Abby. Okay, so um, across the four populations that we measured, prisons, jail, probation, and parole, we have on the left-hand side the black-white disparity ratios. So the disparity ratios are the ratios of the black rates to the white rates. The rates are imprisonment rates, probation rates, parole rates, and so on. And um, they're what some people have called unconditional rates. They're rates based on the resident population. And um, uh, as the charts show, the black-white ratios drop for all populations. For example, for state prison, went from a little over eight to a little over five over the 17-year period. Um, uh, excuse me, for state prison for probation, it declined not quite as much, but it's a downward trend. For Hispanics, again, we see a similar pattern of decreases. Uh, for Hispanics, the biggest drop was parole, where the ratio was about 3.6 or 7 to 1, down to about 1.5, something along those lines, but you can see those trends. Everything's moving downward. In the report, we show the rates uh, behind these disparity ratios, and in general, but not for every population, but in general, what's leading the decrease in disparities is decrease in the rates for blacks and Hispanics. Okay, next slide, please. Um, when we looked at state prison populations, um, the biggest decrease in disparity was for drug crimes, which went from about 15 to 1 down to 5 to 1. And you can see when you look at that line, they're kind of like, three periods. There was an early decrease between 2000 and 2005, kind of a leveling off, and then post-2008, the time when prison populations nationwide began to decline, another decrease in disparity. Uh, property crimes, which are light blue, also decreased, and then um, public order, not much, and violence, we observed a decrease 
in the early part of the study period, from about 2000, 2006, 2008, some uh, a, a faster decrease over that period, slowing, and then kind of a leveling off uh, in the black-white disparity for violent crimes in the latter years of the study period. Uh, next slide. Uh, continuing with the themes, comparing the disparities for women. Um, so the, um, uh, the disparity ratios for women on the left panel and for men on the right panel. And first, um, as the orangeish line shows, the disparity ratios for both men and women went down. For women, they declined from about six to one to about two to one. Um, and they declined as the black female imprisonment rate dropped by about 40%. But the white female imprisonment rate increased by uh, more than that, but to, uh, by more than 50%. So one important thing to keep in mind is that this decrease in disparity ratio from six to two for black to white women is due both to declines for white for black women and increases for white women. In fact, number of white women in state prison increased by over 60%. Uh, compared to about a 40% decrease in the number of black women in prison. Um, for men, uh, the disparity ratio dropped, not quite as much, but still a significant drop. And the main driver of the drop in the black white imprisonment disparity for men was the decrease in the black male imprisonment rate. The white male rate did increase by, by, by about 6 or 8% compared to the much larger decrease for black men. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to talk about these graphs briefly. Our objective here was to um, explain or, quote, decompose the growth rate in the imprisonment rates for blacks and whites. The imprisonment rates, the, the average annual growth rate in the imprisonment rates are to the far right, uh, are the far right bars in each of the panels. These panels show separate crime types. And we decomposed growth rates into components. In this case, we looked at offending rates, arrest per offender, admissions per arrest, and expected length of stay. Now, if you add up within race the bars uh, for offending, arrest, admissions, and length of stay, they'll sum to the imprisonment rate. So they decompose perfectly uh, within race. So one objective of this was to see, first, are there differences in the sources of growth between blacks and whites across stages of criminal justice processing? And what that means is, are the bars associated with the stage going in the same direction for blacks and whites or different directions? When we look at rape and sexual assault, the first conclusion is they're going, the stages are all pretty much pointing in the same direction. That arrest per, admissions per arrest, those bars are pretty tiny, they're not statistically significant but they're going in the same direction. Second question was, how big were the effects? And here for rape, sexual assault, robbery, the next panel, and then when we get to the next slide, aggravated assault, over this period there was a, an average of about a 3% per year drop in the black offending rates. Uh, the white offending rates fell slightly, um, but not for these two, for at least for rape, sexual assault, and robbery, not by the same degree as the black offending rate. So one interpretation of this is this decrease in offending rates would contribute to a lower or smaller imprisonment rate than, if, uh, than an increase in offending would, and we see that contribution. On the other hand, when we look at expected length of stay, um, uh, we see that it increased, or it, yeah, it, in, it, it contributed an increase to both the black and white imprisonment rates. Um, the expected length of stay growth rates, even though the bars differ, the difference wasn't statistically significant. So we do see for rate in that first graph, increases in length of stay that affects both blacks and whites. So for rape, sexual assault, there's decrease in offending rates for blacks combined with the increased length of stay, which was pretty similar for whites and blacks, uh, led to uh, uh, the overall decrease in the prison rate for blacks. For robbery, I'm not going to go through it, but you see a similar story, except that you see the um, arrest per offender, the apprehension rate, 
increase, the growth in it increased somewhat for both blacks and whites, whereas for rape, it didn't. Before I go on to aggravated assault, let me just talk also about the offender rate. So um, uh, we obtained these data by using National Crime Victimization, National Crime Victimization Survey data. Um, since 1973, when the survey's been done, it's asked victims of violent crime to describe the characteristics of their assailants, including age, race, sex, and so on. Um, uh, so we use those data, and uh, we followed what a number of other people have done in the past to use those data to estimate offending rates. So that's where we got the offender rate, and then from that, we used administrative data, the FBI's New Home Crime Reports to get arrest rates, and other BGS data on imprisonment to get the admissions and imprisonment rates. Okay, okay so again, the story for rape, sexual assault, and robbery, the big decrease in the offending rates for blacks, offset by either by increases in length of stay, but the increases affected both blacks and whites, and then some differences when you compare rape and sexual assault to robbery. Um, and then when you look at the aggravated assault, next slide, Abby. Oops. Oh. Well, that one didn't come up. But the aggravated assault slide, the main difference between it and the robbery slide is the offending rates for whites and blacks both drop by about the same rate. And um, the case processing differences, arrest rates, admission rates, and like the state different rates didn't differ between blacks and whites. Okay. Um, because of this decrease in drug crimes, we looked at the drug arrest rates somewhat closely. And as you can see from this um, chart that from 2006 on, there was a pretty big drop in the black drug arrest rate. This is a combined possession, sale, manufacturing, and so on. And um, the white rate, while it fluctuates from about 2008 on, there's a slight upward increase in the rate. Um, and by 2016, it achieved the arrest rate that it had around 2006. So here again, the decline in disparity, the orange line, is driven largely by the post-2006 decrease in the arrest rate of blacks for drug crimes. Next slide, please. And that sets up the analysis of uh, imprisonment rates and, for drug crimes. And just like we did before, we broke it down into components. Here we didn't have an offense rate, so we started with arrests. And um, what we observe is fairly substantial decreases in the growth in the black drug arrest rate and the rate of admission per arrest. So it's kind of like the law enforcement and prosecution side saw, saw decreases that contributed considerably to the decrease in the imprisonment rate. Uh, on the other hand, we do see some differences in length of stay for blacks and whites for drug crimes, as the black length of stay bar is positive and the white negative but not significant. Okay. So um, just summing up briefly, a couple of key points. Uh, one, with drugs, we do see these shifting patterns of enforcement and imprisonment. We observe the largest changes in racial disparity in state prisons for drug crimes. We see, um, because we had limited data on race, offense-specific um, uh, rates in jail, probation, or poll, we can't test whether the disparity in these populations came from drug offenses. Okay, but big effect with drugs. Second, we see these differences for women. Um, key things to keep in mind for women, the decline in disparity for black to white women was due both to increases for whites and decreases for blacks. The increases for white women occurred across violence, property, and drug crimes. For blacks, the decreases were primarily in drug crimes. And I'm sure there'll be some questions when we talk about the association between race and types of drugs and those kinds of issues. And then um, finally, while we observed fairly large substantial decreases for drugs and property, uh, the racial disparity for violent crimes fell by less and it was relatively stable in the last part of um, uh, uh, the study period. And since my uh, colleagues on the council had talked about potential policy impacts, well, one of the things we know that's been happening in prison populations in the last decade and a half is 
the effort to reserve prison space for more serious and violent offenders and to either divert or short sentence, shorten the sentences of drugs and property. So it's kind of a sense of whether or not the black and violent, black white violent crime disparity rate becomes kind of a predictor of longer run uh, disparities in, in prison. Okay, those are the main takeaway points and just a couple of caveats. Abby, you don't even need to go to the next slide. Uh, data, just, just to summarize, the data we used were administrative data. Our view is the administrative data from state and local departments of corrections reflect what the departments know about racial disparities and reflect the operation of criminal justice system actors on persons of different races and ethnicity. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about the methods other than we did a lot of creation of race specific rates, calculate disparity rates, estimate trends, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, final slide. Next slide, yeah. So, a couple things to keep in mind. Um, the reason why we stopped in 2016, it's the most recent year of data, or the, for the uh, most recent year of data by race, for the underlying data we use to generate these offense race, sex specific um, rates. Uh, hoping that more recent data will be released soon just to see if this is a, a continuing trend or what's happening, but we have to wait. Second kind of issue, I mentioned that we focused on using administrative data. And um, that means that our rates and our disparity ratios may differ from those published by the Bureau of Justice Statistics. In BJS reports, BJS makes adjustments to administrative data to try to estimate what, to, excuse me, it makes adjustments to administrative data to um, try to align race and ethnicity with official Office of Management and Budget standards for race and ethnicity. So we do observe, uh, we do have different sources of data. The key thing is the administrative data we're, we, we, we believe they reflect what the departments know and they re about racial disparities and they reflect more of the operational criminal system on people. Self-report data, which is what BGS tries to measure, reflects self-identity. So those give um, a, a slightly different uh, picture of disparities um, as the last point makes. We analyzed our measures with BGS measures and we find virtually no differences in our trends with the BGS trends for the official statistics for the overall uh, trends, not by, by sex or type of crime. We find slight differences between our measures and BGS measures on Hispanic white disparities in the levels, but not in the trends. So those are, I think, the main points, and I'll turn it over to Abby for questions. Well, thank you so much, Bill, and to Thaddeus for not only this very thorough review, but also uh, the great work that went into this report. It's been a long time coming uh, from the council, and we really are appreciative of your work and your time today. We're now able to take questions from our callers on the line. As a reminder, to submit a question, you can click the chat box at the top of your screen. Uh, that will allow you to type a question to me, and I'd be happy to relay that to our speakers today. You're also welcome to email us at info at councilonCJ.org. We already have a few questions in our queue. We'll do our best to get to as many of them as possible today. Our first question comes from Josh, who is working in the juvenile justice system and has noted a similar drop in arrest of black youth in the juvenile justice system for drug offenses. But it doesn't seem to him that drug use is down. So if drug use is not down, but arrest and incarceration it are, what could possibly be explaining this reduction in arrests and incarcerations, particularly of blacks for drug offenses? Bill, would you like to um, speak to that? Can you hear me now? Uh, Bill, you can go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so, as we know, there are certain drugs that have historically been uh, focused with certain race groups. Uh, for instance, uh, crack cocaine, uh, marijuana has been generally associated with African Americans and, uh, and the color. Uh, you also have some other drugs where you call opioids uh, and heroin and things of the sorts. Uh, they have been associated with uh, rural areas and uh, 
white citizens. And so the fact that, that the drug is not down, use is not down, it could be the emphasis of the CJ system on certain drugs. For instance, we know we have been de-emphasizing de uh, marijuana and emphasizing uh, opioids and heroin. So uh, that could be a possibility of why, even though drug use is not down, the justice system has focused on certain drugs as opposed to others. Thanks so much for that, Thaddeus. Our next question comes from Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie wonders whether uh, this analysis designated and examined JRI states separately from other states, um, and is curious whether JRI may or may not be helping to drive the declines in drug arrest and imprisonment rates. Uh, Bill Thaddeus, was that part of your analysis? Um, uh, hi, Steph. This is Bill. Um, no, we didn't do that. It's doable with the data. And um, uh, part of it, part of the reason is we just wanted to sort of describe the trends, lay them out, and get this information out kind of as phase one. And your question is a great question for phase two, three, four, whatever. And it's consistent with Adam's point at the outset that we want to generate additional research um, hypotheses. And because uh, um, we're local, I would like to talk to you more about how to measure that and how to measure the implementation of JRI and try to estimate its effects. So we can do that later. Um, so, but in this analysis, no, we didn't. But it is possible to do that type of analysis. Great. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, a few of our listeners today have had questions about um, other racial groups that weren't included in this study. This study in particular focused on Hispanic, white, and black populations. Um, do we have any analysis to share about Asian, Native American, or other groups that um, that perhaps are seeing similar trends? Um, so the answer is that the numbers are pretty small. Uh, and um, kind of the idea that the, the, the trends for any of those groups would be relatively unreliable. So we focused on those three major uh, groups. Great. Um, another uh, caller is asking whether there are any specific policies, programs, or interventions that have been known to contribute to the reductions in racial disparities and incarceration that are seen in this report. Um, nothing comes to mind. I, I, I'm going to actually throw that to Adam to see if he has any thoughts on that. Thanks, Bill. Um, it's Adam. I, um, I I would love if we had been able to get to that in this report. We had to try to keep things manageable, as you all have, who have looked through the report and seen this data. It's uh, 33 pages, chock, chock full of what was there. So we did um, we did cut off this effort at that point. Um, but I I do really hope that as this work goes forward, we are able to um, uh, identify. Uh, with greater precision than I think we know now exactly what strategies are and are not working, whether it's JRI type strategies, uh, uh, racial impact uh, assessments, and um, other other work going on at risk assessments and things as well. Uh, we can get a better sense of, of what is contributing um, and not at the policy level. Next phases. Great. Thanks so much, Adam. Another person is asking, this goes back to our question about um, uh, specifically about particular racial populations in and out of our analysis. One of our callers is asking how much of the Hispanic Latino white ratio may be affected by agencies that are misclassifying people as white. Uh, Bill Thaddeus, was that a concern in the data or in your analysis? Um, it's a great question. The answer is um, we don't know the specifics, but uh, in a BGS report on prisoners in either 2016 or 17, um, and in the appendix of the report, actually in the appendix of the report, which it's in the report, not in the slides, um, we have a table that compares the administrative data to the survey data in terms of uh, uh, the share of prisoners falling into racial categories. So, for example, I'll just pick one year. In 2016, 
Uh, the administrative data reported about 41% of state prisoners were white. The BGS reports report about 34%. In 2016, the administrative data reported about 40% black, the BGS data about 33%. So that gives you some sense of the difference between the administrative data and what self-report data would say. But to our argument is if agencies are classifying Hispanic, whites as Hispanic or Hispanics as whites or blacks as two or more or whatever, that reflects the agency's understanding. And I think that part of the, one of the reasons for focusing on the agency's understanding is the motivation for change, if there is change, has to start with the agencies, including how they measure race and ethnicity and how they understand the racial and ethnic composition of their populations. So it's a really great question. It's, uh, uh, it, 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 it's very complicated. Um, we know there's some misclassification. We know that occurs. Um, and that, those figures that I gave you kind of give you a sense of that depending on how you measure it, you get some differences in the shares. Um, but as I said in the presentation, when I compare the trends for black, when we compare the trends for blacks and whites with administrative data and official data, the trends are essentially the same. For Hispanics, the trends are the same, but the level differences differ slightly. So. Uh, as our focus was on trends, we went with the uh, administrative data for the reason I said it reflects how these correctional agencies view the racial and ethnic composition of their population. Great. Thank you so much for that explanation, Bill. Um, another person is asking uh, how, where we acquired our arrest data from. Bill, could you speak a little bit more to the source for that data? Yeah, those are from the UCR, uh, the Uniform Crime Reports the FBI. Um, and um, in their, so the so Uniform Crime Reports, it's the FBI summary system in which local police departments report summary counts of persons arrested. And one of the things they report are the number of arrests by type of offense by race and the number of arrests by type of offense by sex, but not the cross classification of them. So one thing we couldn't examine in great detail was how much of that sex difference observed that we observed in the imprisonment disparity came from race sex specific differences in arrests. But I think Thaddeus's comment becomes the operating hypothesis that we need to understand and maybe look at local data where uh, arrest data might be, uh, uh, might be differentiable by both race and sex to see how type of drug, race, sex interact, and then contribute to admissions and those sorts of things. Great, thank you so much. Um, another question that, that we have received um, is thinking more about where this, uh, where this data and this analysis can drive the field. Uh, this is a dense report, and there's a lot of good news in here, but there's also um, some findings that are a bit troubling. Uh, perhaps this question is best for Adam. Are there any findings that should give the field pause or concern that they should focus on for additional attention or intervention? Yeah, good, good question. Um, to me, there are two that really stand out. One is the one is women and the other is expected length of stay uh, on women. As I think Bill pointed out, the, uh, the, dis the disparity ratio has shrunk substantially from six to two. That's obviously a drop of two thirds, uh, but it's happening because of a drop in prison rates for black women and, and a substantial rise for white women. So, um, all right, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to celebrate uh, that, kind of, that kind of trend. Um, and the reasons behind the increase in imprisonment for white women is definitely a, a, an area for further investigation. I think uh, we, we don't have any definitive answers in this report for that, of course, but there's certainly a prevailing narrative around that uh, that relates to, to opioids. Um, the second uh, around, um, around length of stay, uh, one of the key findings, as, as Bill laid out, 
uh, here is that changes in the front end of the system, uh, the fending rates and, and arrest rates, uh, and the, uh, the downward pressure that that is putting uh, on these disparity ratios is being offset, um, in some cases offset fairly substantially by increase in increases in length of stay. And um, as I said a little bit earlier, you know, we just couldn't push in this report to sort of a full menu of policy uh, solutions. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, you know, we did in the conclusion make a, uh, make a pretty pointed reference to the issue of criminal history and the role that criminal history uh, may be playing uh, in this, uh, specifically the possibility that uh, people of color might have accumulated more significant criminal histories uh, through the, the 80s and 90s and the enforcement policies and arrests and prosecution practices that were in place throughout then that, that um, uh, leave them looking worse to courts and parole boards um, along, uh, along the way. Um, we also just made a very brief reference to uh, the issue of uh, disciplinary policies in prisons. Um, this is a particularly underexplored area that could, uh, could be having some impacts here. Right, so I think most of the folks on this call are well aware that uh, disciplinary reports or DRs that uh, people in prison get for behaviors um, can have a decent size, in some cases a, a really significant impact on uh, how parole boards uh, look at you and whether or not they're, uh, they're uh, willing to grant clemency. And um, so it could be, um, it could be something uh, going on at that level that, that needs a lot of further investigation as well. Those were points Abby, I'd, I'd, I'd point to in particular. Great, thanks so much, Adam. Uh, we've talked a bit about the various ways that you looked at race in this analysis, Phil and Thaddeus. Um, one person is asking about how we looked at gender. Is there data on how transgender people are classified within the system and whether that may impact the, the trends that we see? Um, in the administrative data, the question asks about sex, not gender. Um, so in these data, no. But in Bureau of Justice Statistics surveys of prison inmates, um, they ask about sex and um, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity. Uh, I would refer that caller also to, uh, I forget the actual year, but the most recent report that BJS did under the Prison Rape Elimination Act where they surveyed inmates in prisons and jails to look at rape and sexual assault in prisons, and they had questions about um, sexual orientation, and there are a series of tables that were added to the report afterwards that broke out data for, by sexual orientation. I don't remember any of the numbers, but uh, if you go to the BJS website and Google PREA or Prison Rape Elimination Act, uh, you should find all the reports. Look for the one that is based on self-report uh, uh, data from inmates in prisons and jails, and it'll give you uh, some percentages on some measures of uh, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. I don't remember exactly which measures are included in that report. Great. Thanks, Bill. Um, another question that's coming to us from one of our callers, Eric, um, who's asking, um, are admissions, length of stay, and imprisonment rates including in this analysis including both pretrial detainees and post-sentence? Um, and if it is including and in looking at pretrial detention, uh, might improvements in pretrial release and reductions in money bail be having a, an impact on these trends? So, yes and no. Um, the yes part is, we have rates for the jail incarceration rate. And the jail population on a given day consists of a lot of pretrial inmates, about two thirds, about one third are sentenced. Those rates for blacks and Hispanics are going down and the disparity in jail incarceration, jail incarceration is going down. But the prison side is post-sentence. People are admitted to prison either on a new conviction or as a result of probation or parole violation. We put them all in there uh, together. Certainly could be broken out separately and all that kind of stuff. And that gets to one of the other points. The measure of expected time served, it doesn't account for time people spent in jail. Um, 
but it's from the time a person hits the door until the time they're released. Um, so in some respects, if you look at the total time served on a sentence, it's an underestimate. But for the trend analysis, the key thing is, have there been sharp breaks in the period that would shift the amount of pretrial time versus post-sentence time, and uh, that would affect the trends? So that's uh, kind of the underlying issue uh, that, that um, you know, there. I think the question of money bond and bail release and all that, that people focus on is certainly uh, a key issue to understand the pretrial side, but that's beyond the scope of this analysis. Wonderful. Thanks, Bill. Adam, um, do you Hi. want to speak a bit to the pretrial uh, population and uh, the stage of the system? So, um, actually, I wanted, I wanted to jump in um, on this, if I could, on the issue of the time frame here, because I think there's a there's a premise uh, in that question about pretrial reform um, uh, about the time frame, and that is uh, that it, it's really only been in the last few years that there have been significant efforts uh, to uh, to look at cash bail and other uh, other pretrial uh, reforms, um, uh, but I think everybody has, has noticed through the presentation that almost all of these trends uh, uh, started occurring, this downward trend started occurring in the year 2000. Um, and Bill could talk a little bit more about why we had to use that as a starting year and couldn't go back further because of data availability and consistency reasons and really wanting to be tight on that front. Um, not certain you know, how many years even before that this would have started. So. I think it's, it's sort of whether you're thinking about it from pretrial, the pretrial reform perspective, or the earlier question about JRI, or the um, issue of marijuana legalization, uh, the, the rise of the opioid epidemic, almost all of these things uh, started happening fairly significantly after uh, this downward trend was underway. Um, and so it just, it's, um, uh, again, I hate to, to sort of say we need to do more work on this, but of course we do. Uh, but to try to really understand what, you know, what, what was happening and why it would have been that as early as 2000, predating a lot of reform efforts uh, and, and, and other things happening, that this got underway. And if, if I could just embellish uh, a little bit more and build on the response that Thaddeus uh, gave a few minutes ago with respect to drugs, um, there, there are two things that or pieces of the puzzle that are out there. And I don't mean to suggest them here as definitive. I think you know, we put something out like this, we have to be able to talk about it and try to put it in context. Um, and to do that, I would, I, would, I would offer these two pieces, one about supply and one about demand um, for drugs. One is that the, the crack cocaine epidemic uh, obviously was raging in the 80s and into the 90s. But uh, as ep epidemics are cyclical, uh, that epidemic waned, and with it, the demand for uh, for, uh, for for uh, for crack cocaine at the time. Um, and then, uh, on the supply side, uh, if you will, um, we had technology, and uh, coming in the mid '90s, and then moving forward with the internet, and then uh, obviously mobile technology um, uh, that allowed buyers and sellers to conduct their business without having to converge on a street corner in a neighborhood that would cause associated uh, uh, violence and disruption with open air drug markets. And so we had over this period the, uh, the decline of the, uh, the, the crack cocaine epidemic and the um, sort of um, obsolescence, if you will, of the, of the street corner drug market given the ability to conduct those transactions uh, in private. Um, and so just in terms of thinking about hypotheses, what may account for the early, uh, earlier onset of, of these trends, um, those, are, those are a few things that, um, that we should be thinking about and looking at. Great. Thanks, Adam. Um, another question that comes to us is, will, is uh, asking us to go back in and look a little bit at our offending uh, rate information. Um, this caller is asking how much of the reduction in the black incarceration rate may be due to reductions in offending, and why do we only have offense data on violent crime? Uh, can you speak a little bit more to why we don't have that sort of offense rate information for drug or property offenses, Bill and Thaddeus? So the offending rate data come 
from the National Crime Victimization Survey data. And um, uh, when a, a person is a victim of a crime, they're asked to describe the characteristics of their assailant. There's a technical, uh, there's a question in there about presence, whether the person was present. So for most property crimes, people aren't present. So you can't get good data on the race of the uh, offender. For violent crimes, on the other hand, and a lot of violence like aggravated assault is among people who know each other to some degree. So um, uh, they're able to describe uh, the characteristics of their assailants. So that's the focus on um, uh, violent, that's the reason for the focus on violent crimes versus property crimes. Um, and um, I think that some, some question is, well, how much does violence contribute to uh, the prison population? So uh, for blacks and whites equally, violent offenders are about half, one half the prison population. So um, it's, a, it's the biggest chunk uh, of uh, the single, if the offense category that accounts for the biggest chunk of the prison population. Great, thank you so much, Bill. And our last question uh, is going to come for Adam. Uh, Adam, what do you hope that the field takes away from this report? Where do you hope that the field heads to with the analysis that we've released today? Right. What a great question to great question to end on. Um, and uh, I think I, I think I just want to essentially restate what I said at the top, uh, and that is that uh, there, there are really two main aspirations for this. And the first is that policymakers uh, use it to take action. Uh, uh, you know, they, they're going to need more specific information at a state and local level to know exactly where that is. But uh, given the the big picture here, which is that uh, the front end seems to be uh, moving in the right direction and the, the direction of narrowing disparities and the back end is not that um, there, there, there should be a deeper look at sentencing, uh, sentencing and parole release policies, revocation policies uh, uh, with an eye toward, toward this and, and producing these kinds of analyses that can guide that policy work. Um, and then the second really is that we, we hope that, uh, that people who work in this field and are interested in this issue and passionate about it, really care about it, um, look at this, and particularly if they were not aware of it and kind of had an impression that this problem was, was bad getting worse, but seeing it's actually getting better, will um, take it as a source of inspiration and hope that, um, wow, we, you know, we, we, can, we can move things in, in the right direction, that it's really possible to make progress and, and change the system and push public attitudes in, in the right direction. So that's, uh, that's really what we're, we're, we're hoping to accomplish here. Great. Thank you so much, Adam. Well, with that, we've come to the end of our session today. Thank you to everyone for joining us. We invite you to access the full report as well as our web interactive and more information on the Council on Criminal Justice on our website, councilncj.org. You'll also find links to all of those resources from our Twitter feed and other social media channels. We have recorded this session. If you'd like to access the recording or if you'd like a copy of today's slides, please feel free to contact us at info at counciloncj.org. Thank you so much again for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day.